I was a uh, practicing clinician working in a home health agency model. I wasn't allowed to dose my patients as per best practice guidelines. So I said, there's gotta be a way to do this better. My, my grandmother and my grandfather, I started seeing them going in and out of long-term care. It started personal seeing the sick side of 80 and now it's been exciting to be part of Fox. Light bulb moment, like that's a complete game changer. You can see what we can do as a practice and as treating clinicians to really make 80, 85 look so much different than it did back then. That long ago. I boil it down into one say, it's quite simply this, it's be stronger, live better longer. Welcome to Fox Rehabilitation's Live Better Longer podcast. My name is Jim Shear, and today I will be playing you an interview that I recently conducted with Fennell Siegel. She is the president of Infection Control Consulting Services, and she is the infection control consultant for Fox Rehabilitation. We will be talking about COVID, COVID-19 protocols, and just to be fully transparent with you, because as you probably know, COVID protocols can either change all the time, and then sometimes they stay the same for weeks and weeks. So this interview that I'm about to play you, uh, it was recorded on January 11th, 2022. This podcast is premiering on February 9th, 2022. So within the interview, Fennell does reference early February, and I just want you to know that she references February in early January. Just wanted to give you some context before I played you the interview, which I'm going to do right now. Please welcome founder and president of Infection Control Consulting Services, Fennell Siegel. Thank you, Jim. There is more to your title. So founder and president of ICCS, you're a registered nurse. You have been certified in infection control since 1985, and you are a fellow of APIC, Association for Professionals in Infection Control. Am I missing anything? No, you've got it. Thank you. <laughs> and I bring that up because you are an expert. We can agree on that, right? I would agree. Yes, so it's not like you're just some person who's spouting off on social media. You do this for a living. I sure do, Jim. Okay. <laughs> Morning, <laughs> noon, and night. And more mornings and noons and nights. So, Fennell, a clinician who is both vaccinated and boosted, are they in a, a decent place, relatively speaking, if they have to treat a patient who has COVID-19? Yes, they are. It's not just a, a one process type of scenario. So it's really, really important, first of all, that clinicians be vaccinated and preferably boosted. Then you combine that with the effective, uh, appropriate use of PPE. And combining those two makes it much safer to treat a patient with COVID than if one or both of those are, are absent. So that's the perfect scenario, vaccinated and boosted or, or even vaccinated. If somebody has only had their primary vaccine series and has not had a booster, that will still give them a lot of protection combined with the use of PPE. And, you know, Fox Rehab and I have been working on PPE literally since that first day in April. The clinicians that work for Fox Rehab can be 100% comfortable with the fact that even though we have much more PPE available and it's much easier now than it was, they can feel comfortable that we are constantly revisiting to make sure that we maintain the utmost safety for the clinicians. So for now, I have another scenario for you. Let's say a Fox clinician goes into a senior living community. Their patient hasn't tested positive for COVID. However, there has been a COVID outbreak in this senior living community. And in the back of the clinician's head, they may be saying to themselves, well, my patient hasn't tested positive yet, but maybe there's a good chance that they do have COVID. How does a clinician proceed in a situation like this? The most important point about that is, is that we have to follow the um, facilities policy. 
So if the SLC has a policy in place, um, if there's an outbreak in particular, that states that all clinicians must wear full COVID PPE, then obviously the clinician needs to follow that. If a facility does not have a policy for non-COVID or non-suspected COVID patients, Fox has enough PPE to allow um, staff to use it in certain circumstances. And those circumstances can be discussed with their manager and the SLC leadership. So it may not be necessary to wear full PPE, such as an N95, in a facility that has an outbreak if there isn't a policy uh, stating that everybody has to wear uh, um, an N95, for example, and other PPE related to COVID-positive patients. And I have seen both scenarios in long-term care facilities and senior living centers where depending on the actual facility and their policies, they either require full PPE or they don't. So that's why it's very important for the clinicians to discuss uh, with their manager and the SLC leadership if there is any confusion. So if you're vaccinated, boosted, and you're wearing the proper PPE, you're in a good place. You are in a good place. And I would continue those precautions for the duration of the outbreak or the surge. And um, the discontinuation of the high-level PPE um, would be guided by the SLC. Um, and, and also, you know, the state has their own, especially with the senior, you know, the, the nursing homes, any long-term care, senior living centers. So it goes state by state. But at this point, when we are in such a surge, the vaccines and the, um, and the boosting will be complemented by the use of PPE. So everybody, regardless of vaccination status, should be taking the utmost precautions when entering a facility at this point. So now I have one more scenario for you. Fox Clinician goes into a house call. Their patient doesn't have COVID, but someone living in that house does. Yes, we we get this question uh, plenty of times. I think people are looking for the days, like after they have symptoms, is it five days? Is it 10 days? It has been confusing. So what I have been doing with all my clients is making sure that I work with the science and make the decisions on a case-by-case basis. So for a house call where an individual has tested positive and or has symptoms, I think we need to be very cautious because particularly if that individual that is either exhibiting symptoms or is known to be positive cannot isolate. So not every home has the ability to put somebody in a back bedroom and not let them out unless they're wearing a really good fitted mask and they're coming out into a common area or not even coming out at all. So I think it's important for the clinicians to assess this on a house call by house call basis. And if the individual that is um, positive or or has symptoms cannot isolate um, because of the fact that the the, uh, virus will um, circulate in the home, even if they have a mask on, I'm not comfortable with that because that's not uh, basically that's not isolation. Right. Then um, the clinician will continue, obviously, to follow the COVID-19 isolation precautions because there's someone in the home that has it. And I have set the continuation of these precautions for 10 days after the COVID-19 positive household member has had the initial positive test or their first symptom and the patient has remained negative with no symptoms. And the reason why I have chosen the 10 days is because that is where we, you know, we were prior to CDC coming up with the latest. And if you take a look at what CDC says, they say, well, the person needs to isolate for five days and then wear a mask for another five days. So they've taken 10 days and just broken it up into two pieces. And I think that that's just risky. So honestly, those isolation precautions for the clinicians going into a home of that nature should be continued for their protection for 10 days. All right, so let's take a quick break, grab a quick drink of water. When we come back, more with Finel Siegel. Attention to everybody listening to this podcast right now. 
when you are making your rounds on social media, don't forget to follow Fox Rehabilitation on our social media channels. I'm talking Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, YouTube, and who knows, maybe TikTok soon. So when phone is in hand and laptop is on your lap or your desk and you see something you like, make sure to drop us a comment. And also a reminder that we are constantly creating new content over at our website, foxrehab.org. And while you are there, make sure you click on the link, Fresh Fox Content. Once again, I am speaking with Finel Siegel, founder and president of Infection Control Consulting Services. Finel, I have a couple more questions for you. I did want to ask a broad question about Omicron. I've heard some people say, oh, it'll be done in four to six weeks. It'll be done in a couple months. So when do we finally get by Omicron? So when we talk about getting by Omicron, Omicron may very well become our endemic variant that will just linger in, you know, the world. So it'll be like it'll be like the flu. Well, it it may be Omicron, it may not be Omicron. So let's look at what's going on right now. And then let's take a look at what we've seen from other countries. So interestingly, I was born and raised until I was in my early 20s in South Africa. So I have the best of both worlds. I have the South African connection and then my many decades of living and uh, as an American citizen here. So when we take a look at how quickly, and it's happened in our country as well, we've had a massive spike. I mean, way more of, a, of an upward trend very quickly in a short amount of time than we had with the Alpha strain, which was our first strain, and the Delta strain uh, last year. So when we take a look at how quickly Omicron has just skyrocketed and is continuing to skyrocket and did that in South Africa and in the UK as we're watching them as well. When we take a look mainly at South Africa, as quickly as it came up, so it just fell drastically. So there was an exponential rise and then a dramatic fall of the number of cases. What we probably are going to see here is exactly the same. My concern, though, is because we have so many more people um, that are sort of integrated um, in in this country and and mixing, there aren't a whole lot of, you know, in in South Africa, there's more uh, outposts where people aren't mingling with people that are, you know, in the larger cities, etc. I think that it's going to probably take us longer than it did in South Africa to see that downward trend, but I may be wrong. However, at the end of November, when we started seeing what was going on in South Africa, we knew that Omicron was going to hit us hard. I projected at the beginning of February, we're going to start seeing a downward trend. I'm going to stick with that, but I just want to caution people that just because we are going to drop and we will drop dramatically because we do have a lot more people are getting vaccinated now, which is warming my heart because I want people to to save themselves. It's about others as well, but people don't realize that they can be young and fit and get really sick and die from this if they're not vaccinated. So is it a case of just getting a vaccine every year then? I think we're going to see an annual and I'm hoping that they're going to be able to do it incorporated like they did with H1N1, which was a totally different virus, incorporated into one shot. But we may end up by having to have two shots every year. It'll be a COVID vaccine and a flu shot. And if that's what it's going to take to keep those that have remained alive, alive, because we've lost how many millions of people across the the globe, then I think that's the least of our concerns is having to have an annual COVID vaccine. So the moral of the story is have a high health literacy. And the experts in this area, like Fennell, they recommend getting vaccinated getting boosted. And if it comes to the point where we have to get a COVID shot and a flu shot every year, do that. Absolutely. Teamwork. Teamwork. Right, Finel? That's what's going to get us through this. That's what's going to get us through this. If we just get teamwork and cooperation and understanding and lack of fear. I just want you to know that I too have been afraid at times, but I am now feeling so much less afraid because 
I'm boosted and I have my N95 mask to go into facilities that I know have COVID. And right now, I mean, there are a lot of facilities that do. But what I don't want to have happen is for people to be unreasonably afraid. We can all be concerned. This is not something we've ever dealt with. But I want you to know that particularly for people that have been vaccinated, and then those that have been boosted, because there are some people that haven't been boosted yet, and you're still very well protected, but the booster will give you that extra, extra mild dose if you're going to get something. That together with use of PPE and thinking about what you should be doing to protect yourself is something that we really need to learn to live with because we don't know if we're going to get another Delta because Delta was more severe than Omicron, but Omicron is causing a lot of hospitalizations and deaths in the unvaccinated. We need to start learning to live with this and we need to try our best to keep our anxiety down because that actually is causing more problems, especially in people that have been vaccinated, boosted and are using PPE. The fear factor still to walk into a facility that has COVID is actually making people sick from the anxiety. So I just want to try and reassure everybody, and particularly those of you that work for Fox Rehab, working for a company that is taking this so seriously and has from the beginning, must give you that extra level of comfort. All right, last question, Fennell. You mentioned anxiety. So you talk about this subject matter nonstop. How do you step away for a second Just to decompress a little. Unplug. And I literally will unplug. And I'm I I think we have to set boundaries. Um, so for anxiety, I think anything that people would do in a non-COVID world, that because we all live in a very anxiety-driven world, uh, whether we have COVID or a pandemic or not, whatever it takes to just unwind. Um, one has to do. So for me, it's walking. For me, it's going down to the beach and, and just taking in some air and ocean. And I'm sure that there are clinicians that live in places where they can do that, particularly in the warmer climates or the warmer months. I take a break. Sometimes I go and watch some Netflix, not during a work day, but after hours. <laughs> what's, what's your I, go-to show? So right now, I my daughter just begged me to to go and watch Ted Lasso. Okay, and, that's an uplifting show, right? Yeah, and, and you know, well, it's got some sad moments. Oh, but yeah, yes. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. A friend of mine who is what I call a a very, she's she's very cerebral and highly intellectual and needs to chill out a little bit, um, told me never to watch that because I would hate it. So now I don't know if I'm a sub-intellect or if I am just needing something in the way of humor, but I have been thoroughly enjoying it. And I have to confess, I watched two episodes starting at 10 o'clock last night because I had a long day and um, I really enjoyed it. So that one, and then there've been some Netflix shows that I've really enjoyed in the past. All right, for now, I've got one more question. A little less serious, but something that I do think about from time to time. So I have my vaccination card. It's just paper and cardboard. I carry it in my wallet. I'm afraid that by the end of spring, it's going to be disintegrated into nothing. How come these aren't plastic or something more sturdy? Well, I wish I could answer that, Jim. But what I can tell you is, is that I I believe that many people are doing this and uh, I haven't yet, but I need to. And that is to take a picture and have it stored on your phone. Um, or if you or if people there are some people that don't carry their phones with them all the time, if you don't want to put it on your phone or they don't want it to go into the iCloud or be stored somewhere in cyberspace, make a photocopy of it and print that out. But that's legit? That still works? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You you don't have to have, you do not have to have the the original card on you. As far as I know, I have never heard of any place turning down somebody because they had a photocopy in their their wallet. The other problem with with taking the original with you wherever you go is what happens if you lose your your wallet or you lo- or it gets stolen and then your original card has disappeared i know that there have been a lot of questions um about you know i've lost my card what do i do i have been reading something about qr codes and i think there may be app 
jobs that will do something with that that i think i think they, I, I believe that our phones um you know i'm an apple user my my wife has the app okay so there is an app as well so i think that that's but that was an excellent question i wouldn't carry around the original card i would do something in the way of an app or just take a picture a screenshot on your phone or even a, a photocopy cuz usually in most places you have to show your covid vaccination card with your id correct well, Fennell, thank you for speaking with me today. I appreciate it. I, I wish everybody, you know, a healthy and happy and maybe we can finally say PPE free 2022. Knock on wood. Thank you, Fennell. Thank you so much. So for Fennell Siegel, my name is Jim Shear and we will see Yens later.